Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest series of talks. And this will be on the CT evaluation of liver masses with key differential diagnosis findings. This is going to be a multi-part uh, series of lectures. And without further ado, let's get started. Now, it's interesting, if you think about the liver over the history of CT, in some ways, nothing has changed. What have we always tried to do? One, detect the presence of disease. Two, define its extent. And three, define the etiology of the disease process. Obviously, in the liver, the most common lesion is a cyst. But we also have other benign lesions, be it hemangioma, or focal nodular hyperplasia. Obviously, we also have infectious or inflammatory disease like abscesses. We also have vascular processes like infarcts. We also have tumors, be they primary, like a hepatoma or cholangiocarcinoma, as well as metastatic disease. So not only detecting a lesion, but defining what it is. And then at times, we're not certain what the lesion is, and so we can guide therapy, whether it's biopsy or it's resection, and the idea of helping with management decisions particularly if we detect liver lesions and it's metastatic disease, that's going to affect the primary process, whether it's pancreatic cancer or colon cancer. Lots of new theories how to manage liver metastasis. Solitary lesions will often be resected. But nevertheless, everything is in detection, but detection, as we'll speak about, is not enough. The fact that you could detect smaller lesions, the better CT has gotten the smaller lesions we see, but that in and of itself can be more of a problem than a help. When you pick up many small lesions, they're often benign, they're hemangiomas or cysts, and the last thing you want to do is upstage a patient by saying they have liver mets when all they have is a simple cyst, hemangioma, or hematoma. So detection is number one. If you don't find the lesion, obviously you can't classify it, but when you find it, you need to classify it correctly because everything will depend on what the lesion specifically is. Now, when I evaluate the liver specifically, I'm not going to use any contrast material orally. I will give water. So I do have a neutral agent on board that distends the stomach and duodenum, proximal small bowel, and that can be very helpful. So you want to do that. Also, it could pick up pathology in any of those regions. And then we always use IV contrast, either iohexol or iodixanol, about 100 to 120 cc's, and we inject roughly at 4 to 5 cc's a second. Now, in terms of protocols, perhaps if radiation dose wasn't an issue, we would get four or five phases on all patients, but radiation is an issue, and so what we want to do is get enough phases to make the right diagnosis, but no more phases than we need. So for the most case, non-contrast scans are never used. We use non-contrast scans in the kidneys, yes, we do that, in the adrenal, yes, we do that, but in terms of lesion detection, it used to be felt that perhaps in cirrhotic livers, uh, differentiation of uh, regenerating nodules from hepatoma might be helpful by looking at non-contrast studies where regenerating nodules might be denser. But at the end of the day, most people feel that arterial and venous phase imaging alone is enough to detect and define lesions. Occasionally, we will do delayed phase imaging, usually at about four minutes. People talk about delay as three to five minutes. We go at about four minutes post-injection. People also have written about early phase versus late phase arterial. We typically will do late phase arterial. Really, the only thing arterial phase early helps sometimes is vascular maps, but that's not really going to be the case. It really is just too early, and there were a few articles about it, but it never caught on, and essentially nobody will be doing that. So late phase arterial, or 25 to 30 seconds, and then coming back at about 70 seconds for venous phase works very nicely. Now, when I look at the liver, I could break things up into three categories. Tumors, benign and malignant, parenchymal liver disease like cirrhosis, abscess, hemochromatosis, and then infectious disease like abscesses, for example. In this talk, I'm going to focus on tumors. I'm going to go through a range of different tumors, show you their classic appearance, show you their atypical appearance, show you where there's overlap between lesions and where there are pitfalls. So I'm going to try to do all of that and really get you uh, really engaged onto that topic.
Now, when you look at incidental liver lesions, we talk about incidental lesions as being a challenge, whether it's in the pancreas, we talk about the whole problem with incidental pancreatic cysts. We talk about the issues with an incidental adrenal lesion, which are typically adenomas. And then we talk about incidental liver lesions. Now, it used to be a much more complicated structure. Um, we've made it a lot simpler. Uh, one of the things to recognize, surely in the patient without malignancy, the majority of lesions, the great majority, are going to be benign. But we really need to figure out how to recognize lesions, how to classify lesions, and how to manage patients. So let's look at some of the things we need to think about. Well, one thing to think about first, and a good way of starting, is looking at benign tumors. So we put hepatic cysts, hemangiomas, and FNH at the top of the list, and hepatic adenomas kind of at the bottom. One could say hepatic adenomas have a predisposition for becoming hepatomas, and so in many ways they're not exactly benign tumors because many of them will be uh, pre-malignant, but we'll keep it as sort of the um, connection between benign and malignant hepatic tumors. There are other lesions in the liver that are benign, lipomas, more common in patients with tuberous sclerosis, hamartomas, but these are the big three. Now, when we talk about lesions, we often talk about cystic versus solid. There was a good review by Borhani on cystic hepatic lesions, and perhaps we'll start with there. Again, most cystic lesions, if you close your eyes, are benign cysts, so it's not going to be very difficult. And others will be on the spectrum of um, serous or just cyst adenomas or cyst adenocarcinomas. But that cyst adenoma, biliary cyst adenomas, septations, nodularity, and again, we'll talk about those later. We used to think about benign versus malignant. Now people consider all biliary cyst adenomas as potentially malignant and will resect them. But we'll talk about cystic lesions. We can divide them, as this article did, into developmental, inflammatory, like an abscess, neoplastic, and trauma-related, typically a biloma. We can talk about developmental hepatic cystic lesions as hepatic cysts, hamartomas, polycystic liver disease, which half the time or so is associated with polycystic kidney disease, Corolli's disease, and ciliated hepatic foregut duplication cyst, which is the rarest of the lot. We can also think about cystic lesions as being inflammatory, be they liver abscesses, pyogenic or amoebic. Hydatid is classic for being cystic, though with multiple daughter cysts. Amoebic abscesses are cystic, but typically right lobe of the liver. And of course, fungal abscesses are numerous and they're small, commonly also involve the spleen, may involve the kidney. But what we know about these lesions, of course, is they're typically in immunosuppressed patients. So one of the things, of course, when we do a differential diagnosis, you need to know the patient's history and presenting symptoms that will really help you in triaging specifically the problem at hand. We can also talk about cystic malignant tumors, biliary cyst adenomas. As I mentioned a few moments ago, we used to argue cyst adenoma versus cyst adenocarcinoma based on nodularity. But now all of these lesions will be resected because they're all considered either malignant or pre-malignant. We talk about cystic liver mets, classic ovarian cancer and gist tumors. And we talk about cystic hepatocellular carcinoma, uncommon but does occur. But when those lesions are cystic, they have thickened and often irregular walls, often with enhancing walls. So you're not going to confuse a cystic hepatocellular carcinoma with simply a benign cyst. We also can see cystic lesions that are trauma-related, hematoma, bioloma, and seroma are kind of the classic three that we think about. We then have incidental or miscellaneous lesions, peribiliary cysts, intrahepatic pseudocysts occasionally from pancreatitis, hematoma for underlying tumors like hepatic adenoma, and often when the patients present late and it's not high density, it can be somewhat tricky. We could talk about pseudoaneurysms, which are poorly visualized on the uh, non-contrast scans. They look low density. Obviously, with contrast, they become very bright. It makes it easy. And of course, at times, focal fat can be somewhat confusing in terms of appearance and in terms of diagnosis. So let's talk about hepatic cysts. 
They occur in about 10% of patients. Water density with sharp margin sounds just like renal cysts, and they can be and are often multiple. Here's a good example of a cyst in the right lobe and a cyst in the left lobe. They can be symptomatic at times because they can get very large and can have mass effect, but there's no malignant, uh, underlying malignant pre uh, condition. There's no evidence with simple cysts have increased incidence of bleeding. Anything that's strategically located or becomes large enough can surely cause symptoms. So we'll at least keep that in the back of our mind. Here's that same case. Again, the classic water density, well-defined, no thick inceptations, no abnormal enhancement, no definable wall. You can see in this case, the cyst is much larger. You can imagine why this patient has symptoms. The cyst is pushing on the diaphragm, it's stretching the capsule. So a benign lesion can give you symptoms. So just because the patient's symptomatic does not mean they have a malignancy. Large, simple cysts can do it. And again, this one has septations. You might consider in a differential diagnosis a biliary cyst adenoma, perhaps. They, they can be cystic with septations. So at times there can be some overlap, but usually there's not a problem. We talk about hepatic cysts as being well-defined. There's no neovascularity. Occasionally when large enough, they displace vessels. But in most cases like this, you can see the portal vein and hepatic veins are not distorted by that large cystic lesion. And again, in terms of looking at the lesion, whether it's MIP or volume rendering, the lesions are very sharp. Typically vessels are displaced. There's no neovascularity, but as I mentioned, sometimes you can see some compression of arterial structures, especially when a cyst gets large enough and is strategically located. In this case, you wonder, is there enhancement of the medial wall of the cyst? And what you're simply dealing with here is that there's compression of the hepatic parenchyma. The hepatic parenchyma is compressed, so it enhances a bit more than the rest of the gland. So it can be confusing that maybe you're worrying about, could this be something else rather than a simple cyst, maybe hemangioma or something else, but that's not going to be the case. And again, here's a good example of where the hepatic artery is splayed. But again, there's no neovascularity. It's simply the large mass spreading that hepatic artery out very nicely. We talk about cystic lesions as polycystic liver disease. Polycystic liver disease has a range of cysts from small to large. Often, like this case, it's a dominant cyst with multiple additional cysts. Sometimes the entire liver is replaced by one to two centimeter cystic lesions. Polycystic liver disease is commonly associated with polycystic kidney disease in about half the cases. So just a very nice set of examples. Do not confuse this with any other lesion. If you're ever in doubt, ultrasound can be done and can be helpful. Most hepatic cysts will measure under 10 Hounsfield units in size or density. And here's a range of the different sizes from a couple centimeters to over 10 centimeters. Sometimes the cysts are two millimeters. And those are the ones we mentioned before can be tricky in terms of making the right diagnosis because there's too much partial averaging to be very specific as to what the lesion in fact really is. So just some very nice examples. And you can see as we go from arterial to venous phase, those hepatic arteries will wash out. And so the interface to liver is just related to the mass effect by the patient's large cyst. Now I mentioned polycystic kidney disease and polycystic liver disease go hand in hand. Half the patients have with polycystic liver disease approximately will have polycystic kidney disease. So in this case, you see the multiple too numerous to count liver cystic lesions, and then you also see the multiple renal lesions, very nicely seen. So again, polycystic kidney disease and polycystic liver disease, very nice example of what needs to be done. Now I mentioned hepatic cysts are benign. Sometimes when they get large enough and anything large enough can cause symptoms, Here's a good example of a large cyst which compressed the patient's portal vein and caused all sorts of issues related to that. You can see because of its mass effect and vessel compression that it has perfusion related changes in the liver. So that's an issue. Other things that can be confusing, when you look at this quickly, you can say this is a cystic lesion, maybe it's a biliary cyst, but then you see the white dots which are clips and then you realize this patient had recent hepatic surgery. This is a biloma. 
So bilomas in the surgical bed initially can be high density. They will contain blood often. And so maybe it's easier then to make the right diagnosis. When you see it a few weeks later and you don't really notice the surgery on the chart, you can be confused with this. But again, look at the margins, very sharp. And look at those high density structures, which surely are clips. So just a very nice example of a biloma. Now, in terms of cystic lesions, everything for the most part I've shown you has been benign. I want to remind people that cystic lesions could be metastatic. I mentioned before things like carcinoid tumors, things like melanoma, you know, are can all have cystic metastasis. Just tumors are especially classic. Here's a good example of what almost looks like cysts, but then you see thickened walls in all of the cysts. Some of the walls are enhancing, and you don't quite see the uh, wall irregularity, but it's there. When you look carefully, you see what looks like enhancement in the wall. Just a very nice example of multiple, not simple hepatic cysts, but as I showed you in the last case, metastasis from a carcinoid tumor. Is there anything specific for carcinoid? Well, I would have considered ovarian cancer in the right patient age group and history. I would have considered um, other uh, GYN tumors, occasionally melanoma. But again, just a really nice example you can see on the later phase, many of the lesions have some filling in on the periphery, but those are not hemangiomas. Those are going to be metastatic lesions. And another example, you can see the thick wall in this case, faint calcification, but a regular wall in calcification. There's some neovascularity best appreciated in the coronal view. And in this case, no one's going to say, gee, I think it's a simple cyst or maybe a cyst adenoma. No, no, it's a thick walled cystic lesion with rim enhancement. You can see as you go back here, the rim enhancement gets better on the MIP imaging. But this was a, a sarcoma. Beautiful example of the neovascularity. The irregular thickened wall on the um, 60 second images is nicely shown. And another example here, is this a simple cyst? Well, it is cystic, but when you look at it, the wall is thickened. I guess you could have considered an abscess as a reasonable thinking process. Um, the other thing you could have thought about was a biliary cyst adenoma. Though the walls typically aren't thickened and you typically will see septations. So uh, here you can see what this was. There's a large mass in the pelvis, large cystic liver lesion, but the walls are thickened. It's not a simple cyst. And this is metastatic, just tumor of the small bowel to the liver. So again, one of the causes of cystic tumors, but just a really nice example of the primary tumor as well as the liver lesion. Another case, small bowel, just tumor metastatic to liver. You can see some soft tissue thickening within the lesion. You could see the... Uh, cystic component with thickened wall and irregularity, which goes along with the patient's malignant diagnosis. You can see in this case, there's a cystic lesion with significant perfusion changes in the right lobe of the liver. Now, primary tumors can give you perfusion changes, particularly if they're infiltrating, but a benign cystic lesion will not. Well, this patient was febrile. Look at all those perfusion changes in the right lobe of liver. This ended up being an abscess. So abscesses, amoebic abscess, most commonly right lobe of liver, as we mentioned before, can be cystic. Here's kind of a ring appearance. Again, you would have worried about metastatic disease. This patient was a few weeks post-surgery, and so there is some overlap, but a beautiful ring-like appearance of a liver abscess. And of course, once you see multiple air bubbles, a post-operative abscess is a very easy diagnosis, is the other cases where it's kind of tricky. So now let's look at what typically I would call multilocular cystic hepatic masses from a differential diagnosis perspective. And we'll talk about biliary cyst adenomas and carcinomas, hepatoma, metastasis, mesenchymal hamartoma, and IMT or inflammatory myobla myofibroblastic tumors. And again, we're going to look at these lesions across the spectrum of malignancy and infectious and inflammatory process, including hepatic abscess, biloma, and even polycystic liver disease. So let's start first with biliary cyst adenomas. But before I get started, I realize we've run almost 20 minutes now. Let's take a five-minute break, and we'll come back and pick it up. See you in a few minutes.
If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.